Father, we thank you for our graduates today who we are celebrating. We thank you that heaven is also celebrating with us. And even as we celebrate them, O oh Lord, we pray that you will take them to greater and higher heights. The achievement that we are celebrating today will not be the end, but even greater things will happen. And I'm praying that even as we go into your word today, Lord, you will minister this word to us and use it to sharpen them and prepare them for the great destinies that you have for them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, I have a word which I targeted to those who have graduated. But don't get up and leave if you didn't graduate. Because in life, every day is a graduation for you. Every week is a graduation for you because you move on to new things. Every month is a graduation for you. Every year is a graduation for you. So even though they got certificates, degrees, and so on and so forth, and we call them here, we celebrated them, we are celebrating ourselves too. Because as they move from one phase to the other, in life, daily, we are moving from one phase to the other. And I put a scripture in the bulletin. Um, I put a scripture in the bulletin. It's from the book of Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. It says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. Which means even Jesus, when he was born, he don't remain the same. He kept increasing, increasing, increasing. And that is his purpose for all of us. And today I want us to look at a scripture again, which talks about growth, which talks about maturing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 11. Please read it for me. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. Mm -hmm. I thought as a child. Mm -hmm. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Amen. Amen. So the Apostle Paul is saying that as he grew, as he matured, as time passed, amen, the way he spoke changed. The way he understood changed. And the way he thought also changed. So with time, there must be changes in our lives. Those of you who are going from high school to college, you are going to find that now when you come from school, your parents won't be there to ask you, have you done your homework? It's you and your friends. And incidentally, if you don't do your homework, your professor will not send a note to your parents to make sure you do your homework because you're on your own. No one will make sure that you go to bed on time or even you eat. In fact, my first year in college, I missed dinner the first day because I was expecting them to ring a bell because I went to a boarding school and they rang the bell for dinner. And I was hanging around, and that's when I knew, they said, dining is over. I said, why didn't they ring a bell? Buddy, you are in college. No more, nobody regiments anything for you. So you can't take the high school attitude to college. Are you hearing me? Because the next thing you will know is the end of the semester and you are getting an F. Amen. Then you have to start the process of hiding your grades from your parents. Because the school gives the grade to you and they don't give it to your parents, unlike high school. So things have to change. Those of you also who are in undergraduate, you graduated, you are going to graduate school. One sister in this church who went from undergraduate to graduate school came to me and said, Pastor, these professors are not good. I like my undergraduate uh, professors because they really spend time with you and they teach you well. These people, they are too, I said, uh-uh, uh-uh, that's undergraduate. You see, undergraduate, they teach you. In graduate school, they help you to find out things for yourself. So they don't spoon feed you. So if you go to graduate school and you think somebody is going to come, those of you in the Bible school, the master's class, right? I want some of you, you didn't believe me. Because in their bachelor's class, they give you lectures, they teach you, then they give you exam based on the lecture. In the graduate classes, you got to read a book, and you got to write a report on the book. And now we are realizing that it's no more multiple choice, A, B, C, D. Now you got to write what you think. And incidentally, there are a lot of things you know, but... This time, when you write it, you need to provide a reference. Where is this coming from? What's the basis for saying this? So it's a whole new level. And those of you who are going from school also into work, um, what we do in school is that they try to create a controlled environment to try to teach you what goes on in the real world. 
But I said controlled. Amen. Controlled. So we try to make things simple. Your professor makes it simple so you understand. In fact, when I went to business school, the professor came to class and said, we are going to assume that the U.S. economic system is closed. It's a closed system. That's they forget about what happens in the world. The United States is closed on its own. The dollar does everything. But you know what? If there's a war in the Middle East, oil prices will affect the U.S. economy. But in the classroom, they make it seem so simple. And then when you go to business school, you manufacture something called widgets, which don't exist. It's a creation of their mind to make things so simple for you. But when you go to the real world, I promise you, it's more complicated. And the office politics alone can drive you crazy. You may know how to run your computer, but the office politics alone will you know, distract you. I remember one young lady who I knew came to do an internship with me, and I said, do you know how to work with spreadsheet? Oh, yeah, I, I'm good at it. I know this. And they started telling me, if you look up, all kinds of stuff. And I shook my head. I said, come. Then I gave them a spreadsheet. And I said, please, figure out and do these things for me. Say, hey, why are there so many numbers? The thing is too big. How do you give me figure out? I said, aha, uh -huh. this is the real world. <laughs> Amen. This is the real world. So you, 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 you have to mature. You have to grow. You can't take your high school mentality to college, and you can't take your college mentality to graduate school or even to the real world. And I just want to emphasize one thing to you today, and that's going to be the topic for my message. When you mature, when you grow, it is okay to say no. That's what she was talking about today. I know some of you were confused. You have to learn to say no. For example, when you are in school, high school, all your friends, oh, let's go join this club. Let's go, and you are following them. Let's go. You can't take the attitude to college. Are you hearing me? <laughs> because you have to learn to make decisions as a mature person. Decide when you eat, what you eat, and so on. And you make decisions even on your own diet. You know, your parents decide what is healthy for you. They cook it for you. They make you eat it. And they're going, I don't like, I don't like this. When you get your own chance, you go ahead and eat junk food every day. By the time you come back, your, 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 what do you call it? your cheeks will be like that, and your belly will be like that. Amen. You have to learn to say no. It comes with maturity. Hallelujah. And you know what? We're going to study the life of Jesus. Even Jesus himself said no. How many of you know Jesus is a nice guy? He is so nice. I mean, he died for people like us. Amen. We mess up, he forgives us. But even Jesus had to say no. And I wanted to look at three cases, if time will allow us. Wherever we get to, we'll stop. Let's go to the book of Mark chapter 1. Let's go to the book of Mark chapter 1. Please read verse 21 for me. Verse 21. Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. Which means this story that we're going to read is based in a town called Capernaum. And Capernaum is in Galilee. Don't forget, Capernaum. Amen. Say Capernaum. Amen. Now, let's keep to verse 32. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak, because they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. Amen. Let's stop right there. So Jesus is in Capernaum, which is in Galilee. And he did many miracles. They brought the sick. He healed them. The whole town came. The demon possessed. He cast out demons. That's Jesus. Amen. Nice guy helping everybody. So at night, you know, they went away. And he woke up early. He went to pray. And if you look at the scripture very well, by the time he finished praying and came back, I'm sure there was a line. People have brought family members who were sick. Who were demon possessed, the whole Capernaum is waiting for day two of the crusade, of the miracle crusade. And so Peter goes to him and says, Hey Lord, they are here, they are ready for you. They have lined up, they've brought the sick, their wheelchairs, I mean, all kinds of stuff, and they are ready for you. But what did Jesus say? Please read the next verse for me. 
But he said Let's to them, mm -hmm. Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. Amen. So Jesus said no to the sick. He said no to the, lame, the, 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 the demon possessed who have come and lined up probably from dawn waiting for him to come and heal them. Peter came and told him, Lord, they have come. They have lined up. They are ready for you. Come and do more healing. He said, no, no, no. I must go on to the other towns because this is my purpose. So what Jesus said no to those who had needs, who needed him. Because his purpose, he had three years on earth. Limited time and resources. Nobody has more than 24 hours in the day. Anybody here has more than 24 hours? No, you don't. If it's money, you have limited. Jesus' purpose was that for that season, he will visit many towns in Galilee. He started with Capernaum. They had needs. But he did not allow their needs to determine his agenda. Amen. His purpose was to hit many towns. So whether there are a thousand more people left, I got to go. Because there are other towns waiting also for me. I got to share the gospel. I got to preach it in all those towns and heal their sick also. So the needs in Capernaum will not determine my agenda. And Jesus said no. Is somebody taking that in? That's a very difficult thing to do. But if you are going to mature, you are going to grow. Learn to let your purpose determine your agenda and not, you know, determine what you do, your choices, and not people's needs. That sounds like a tough thing. But I'm telling you, when you go to college, your purpose is to get a degree. Amen. It's to get a degree. Don't let the needs of your friends for socializing affect you. Because the bottom line is that that will not give you a diploma. It will not give you a degree. Amen. You are spending a lot of money. You are taking out student loans. And those loans must be paid. Amen. Those loans must be paid. And there's nothing like coming out of school without a degree and yes, to receiving a bill for student loans. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus set a very serious example for us here. If you are not careful, aggressive people around you will determine the agenda of your life and you will never fulfill God's purpose for your life. You must know your purpose, you must know your goal, and that is what must drive your decisions. Amen. Amen. Those of you who are going from high school to college, in high school, you know, anything goes, you know. And some of you also, in high schools, you get all A's. You are smart because it's easy. When you go to college, then you will sit down and you find other people like, wow. We have a saying in my language. We say my being. So some people, they are being more than me. You are an A student in your class. Everybody who came to that college is also an A student from their high school. So don't play. Amen. Have a goal, have an agenda. When Ajoa went to college, she played soccer all of high school. You know, played soccer. And when she was going to go to college, she said she was going to play soccer. We contacted the soccer coaches and so on. And actually, they went ahead to prepare for soccer. You know. <laughs> then classes started. And she discovered that, hey, when I finish my homework, it's time to go to soccer practice. So she called home, that, hey, mommy, I want to quit soccer. Why do you want to quit? Because it's interfering with my schoolwork. Me, when you go to class, I tell you your job, your life is the degree. Go and get it for me. I don't care what you do. You don't have to work. I don't want you to go work at McDonald's or anything. Get me the degree. I'll pay your school fees. That is my job as a parent. You get me? So I say, it's, it's interfering with the degree. It's interfering with your purpose. You like the coach. He's a nice guy, but quit. And I said, go tell the coach that I quit. You have made friends on the soccer team. Yes, they all came from different places for different purposes. You came for a degree. Anything which interferes with that must go. So she went and said no to the soccer coach. And the man said, you know something? I respect that. All of the they ran away. At least you came to tell me that you can't play anymore. So whenever you feel you have to it, come back. And after four years, she never went back. But I thank God. She came back with a degree. Amen. Amen. You have limited time and resources. And if you can't fit everything into your time and resources, determine what is your priority, your purpose, and let the other things go. And Jesus said, Capernaum, I did not come for only Capernaum. I came for all the cities in Galilee. I will finish with them. 
I will go to Samaria because he started the ministry in Judah. He came to there. I have to go to Samaria also. So your, your line is there. I see the line. But that is not what is going to determine my agenda. I know my purpose. Know your purpose. Know your agenda. Hallelujah. When you get a job and you go on the job, please, let me give you some counsel. Everybody came to the job for a different purpose. Your goal there is to succeed and gain promotion and gain increases. Hallelujah. Some people, they just came there as a stepping stone. But you want to make a career of it. Don't be following them every time they want to do some, cause some trouble. I hope you get me. So know your purpose. Hallelujah. And anything that contradicts your purpose, say no. And that is the lady what Jesus did here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Know your purpose. The second example is in Luke chapter 2, where Jesus also said no. And we read verses Luke 12, 13 through 15. Luke 12, 13 through 15. Luke 12, verse 13 through 15. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Hallelujah. This one was a social justice issue. The man came to Jesus. My, our father left an inheritance. My brother has taken all the inheritance. So please, talk to my brother to share my inheritance with me. This is a, who made me a judge over you? Or an arbitrator? Look, the, the court system is there. Hallelujah. The lawyers are there. If you have been offended, go hire a lawyer. I am a nice guy. You know, Jesus was teaching about the Beatitudes on the Sermon on the Mount, how, you know, blessed are the peacemakers and all these things. But he's not going to bring world peace. He said, I came to bring war and not peace. Know your purpose. Certain problems are not your problem. Are you hearing me? Don't run and get yourself in anybody's wahala. And look at what Jesus told him in verse 15. The man's issue was that he was covetous. And some people, they have their own agenda. Yes, they come and wrap you up. And then you are going around and you are quarreling, you are fighting everybody. In the meantime, the people you are fighting with for them, they are their best friends. Amen. Some of you, you go to college and you're going to meet people who have an issue, social justice, they have an issue with everything. (laughs) I won't forget this. My generation in Ghana, we're trying to overthrow the military government. Kutuwe Champon, a Luther generation. Many of you are too wrong to know. We demonstrated against them. They beat us. (laughs) <laughs> One time I was arrested, though. <laughs> there were people who were instigating us to overthrow this government. One day, I'm at Makola, which is a central market in Accra, and somebody was arresting people who were selling above control price. So if you, are too, you remember those days? And it was that guy. Ah, you are against the government. You are against the military government. And I, so I went and said, Charlie, where are you working? I said, I work at the castle. Hey! The man who was instigating us, they come and say, let's go, demo, demo. Then we are in town, demonstrating against the government. Now you wait for that government at the castle? And then he told me, you know what? Even the goods I'm seizing here from these traders, I'll give them to my wife to go and sell. Hey! (laughs) And we were risking our lives for people like that, demonstrating. There used to be one guy. He can make speeches, big, he can make a speech, you feel excited, but I don't understand what he's saying. <laughs> big, big, big English. And you know the school I went to, the school of technology, engineers, mathematicians, we don't know English. They just calculate. We are calculators, we are not English speakers. And this guy will come and stand there, and you do some Latin phrases, and we are excited. Hey, then he say, charge, and we all go. Then he goes to sleep. And we go and say, yes, beat us up. There are people like that in the world. Know your agenda. Know what is important to you. Somebody has an inheritance. You come from Africa. You know what I'm talking about. Some of these people, their traditions are very complicated. And then you have to meet this one and talk to this one and try to resolve. Who made you a judge over them? And Jesus said, please, me, I have three years. I came to preach the gospel of heaven. Amen. So that people will find God. So please, don't get me involved in your family matter. Go and find some uncle of yours. If you like, go get a lawyer. But me, that is not my field. Lawyer for is here. And even for him as a lawyer, he doesn't do family law. He doesn't do immigration. And I'm a boy. Yes. So he can't help you. 
And yesterday you go to him, uh, 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 lawyer, I need an you, ask, you expect him to follow you to immigration. If you go, that is not his specialty. Amen. But sometimes we allow our passion about certain things and people incite us. And we are all excited and we are going to fight. We are going to demonstrate. <laughs> There's a story one, one musician in Ghana told about this guy who met with some friends. And they were talking about how their wives are misbehaving. And the women are like this, and the women are like this. And then the guy said, yeah, I want to divorce my wife. Then the friend said, yeah, let's go and divorce her. Said, let's go. And they were all following him. Ah, these women, who do they think they are? Then he went there, they met the wife, and the father-in-law gave them water. Said, why did you come? Then the son-in-law told the father, oh, how's my daughter? She's fine. And they, oh, no, me and my wife, we are fine. But my friend says, I come and divorce her. <laughs> Please, don't follow people to go and divorce their wives. In the end, you will be blamed. And the man and his wife, they'll be having a good time. You know, someone told me one time, somebody called him. He was sleeping with his wife. My friend, Look, I want to kill my wife because my wife is cheating on me. Come, 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 come. If you want to kill your wife, how did you need me to kill him? <laughs> when your man here, I wasn't there. It's your wife. If you want to kill her, at least. Uh, I'll call 911. The police will come. Don't call me. So the man said he was so sleepy. He didn't go. The following morning, he decided to go and visit his friend to see if he has killed his wife. When he went... Fried eggs, big bread, margarine, milo, hot chocolate. The man was eating and was rubbing his back. He said, my friend, what happened? He said, oh, no problem here. Be careful the fights you get yourself involved in. Amen. Jesus said no to that one. Please learn to say no. Hallelujah. And don't go around fighting everybody's battles. Let's look at the third case. This story is in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And that's the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus fed the 5,000. The story goes all the way to verse 13. Then verse 14. Please read verse 14. After Jesus fed the 5,000. Look at what happened there. Verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Mm -hmm. Now, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went to the sea towards Capernaum, and it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Amen. So these people came. <laughs> they want to make Jesus king by force. Be careful when people decide they want to make you the boss by force. There is something you have. Amen. But look at what Jesus said in verse 26. Skip to verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, Amen. which the Son of Man will give you. Because God the Father has set his seal on him. Amen. You see, Jesus came to be the bread of life, to give us eternal life. But he also has power to give us physical food. And they wanted to make him a giver, a king, so he would give them physical food. So Jesus said, look, food is good. How many of you know that? There are people starving in the world. We want to help them. We want to feed them. Food is good. But Jesus wanted to give them the best. Sometimes when you say yes to a good thing, you are saying no to the best. Is that making sense to you? And that's what Jesus refused to do. It's a human need. Yes, food is important. He fed the five times. He said, don't go get I will feed them. And he fed them. And he did it again. At one point, he also fed 4,000. So Jesus believed in feeding people. It's a good thing. But don't ever say yes to a good thing and end up saying no to a bad thing, to, to the best. It's better to say no to the good thing so that you can give someone the best. And parents understand this. Sometimes you say no to your children and they tell you you are mean. But you know one day they will thank you. Young people, are you hearing that? My children are old enough now, so now they thank us. Because they wanted designer clothes. He said, no way. I'm not going to buy a shoe for $40 and buy you a sneakers for $200. You've never paid taxes before. It ain't happening here in my house. If you have your own money, I'll give you what I can give you. If you can find more money to add it, that is your problem. You are a mean parent, and you are a mean. All oh, my children have it, and my, my friends have it. Today they sit with us and they tell us that all those who were our, where we live, the schools, 
It goes from Capital Heights, Mitchellville, Upper Marlboro, okay? And Capital Heights is like the bad neighborhood, and we live in the good side. He said, all the children who wore the designer clothes, we see that they all get off the bus in the bad side. All the children who got off on the good side, where the big houses are, they don't wear designer clothes. He said, good. The best thing is that you live in a good neighborhood in a good house. You know, the good thing is that you may wear designer clothes. So I will deny you, I will say no to, to the designer clothes so that I can give you a better life and be able to pay for your college. Because that is better. That is the best for you. Amen. So as you go to college, as you go to the workplace, make up your mind that you will say no to the good things. Because behind it, there is the best thing. Whenever see it, Life is about choices. You say yes to something, you are saying no to something. You say no to something, you are saying yes to that. So be careful what you do. Amen. Somebody says, let's go to a party tonight. By saying yes to that, you are saying that you are going to fail your exam tomorrow. Because you have a test coming up. But you will say no to the person. They say, and you don't like having fun. But you know what? When the exam result, the exam that is taking place, when the results come, then you know that you can have fun. Because you're going to have your A's. And you're going to be dancing and still having a good time. Hallelujah. And all of you going to college, high school, college, let me, tell, let me tell you one thing. The bottom line for any teacher, the bottom line for your friends, if you do well and you graduate well, they'll respect you. It doesn't matter. Look, I had a teacher in high school. My goodness, that man. I was so scared of him. He punished me one day and I swept a whole hockey field alone. And when he came, he checked to make sure. And he told me, if I had found one speck of mess here on this thing, I would have slapped you. And he used to call, tell me, you fool, fool, fool. Hey, what have I done to this man? Then when I went for my high school results, I saw the man. He said, fool, what did you get? I said, I got grade one. I could get 12. He started to smart. I knew you were smart all along. I knew you were smart all along. Look, all this going and coming, those people who, who think you are popular, who are always trying to divert your attention, if you fail in the end, they will laugh at you. They will tell you, let's go hang out, hang out, go hang out with them, and they say you are cool. When you don't graduate with a degree, they wouldn't even want to come around you. But they can call you all kinds of names. You do well. Let them meet you one day at the gas station, pumping gas into your legs. You can't, man, I went to high school with him, man. That's my brother, that's my, 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 you know. You know what I'm saying? They'll forget all the bad things they said about you. So that is the best. Don't say yes to the, to the good thing so that you miss out on the yes. Learn to say no. Hallelujah. 